We'll be starting our first part of the topic for topic four and option C. And what we're going to be focusing on are species, communities, and ecosystems. So some of the essential questions that I would love for you to be able to answer by the end of this is how do species interact with each other and the environment? And how can you create a sustainable ecosystem? So just so you know how we're going to break this up, uh, the topic four, we're going to break up into a couple parts. This portion will be 4.1 and C1, as well as 4.4 and C3. Those will be the areas we'll, we'll kind of break it up and then we'll do some sort of an assessment and then we'll move on to the other portions of topic four and option C. So these will be the areas you'll be doing a portfolio for in this unit. You've already started your 4.1 and C1 based on what I gave you time for last class. So just so you kind of know how we're gonna break this up in the beginning. Okay, so let's get started. We're gonna start in this picture down here in the corner. So we need to break down the different definitions of the things that make up an ecosystem. So first, a species. A species is a group of organisms that can interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. That's important. Just because they can breed together doesn't always mean their offspring will also be fertile and be able to reproduce. So it has to be, they have to be able to interbreed together and produce fertile offspring. We call that a species. When there's multiple organisms of the same species together, we call that a population. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area at the same time. Now we're gonna bring this over to community. A community is a group of different populations of different species living and interacting with each other in an area. Now, a community is part of an ecosystem, and an ecosystem is a community and its abiotic factors, so all the non-living things that are there as well, so like water, sunlight, different nutrients that are cycling, so non-living things, but things that would support different communities or the community with its different populations of individual species. We also need to break down the different feeding methods. So we have two main type of feeding categories if we are going to break this down and how these organisms survive. And this is how we can start classifying um, relationships in an ecosystem. So we have autotrophy, which is basically a self-feeding type of species. So these organisms will produce their own food from organic molecules. So plants, for example, they can make their own food or their own sugar. The other group is heterotrophy, which is an other source feeding is what that would break down to. So this would be organisms which derive energy from other living organisms. So let's focus in on autotrophy first. So a word you've probably heard before is producer, maybe from 10th grade biology or if you've taken environmental science or from middle school. So we also use the same word when we talk about producers, we say autotrophs, okay? So producers, there's two different kinds. There's photoautotrophy, which means they do photosynthesis. They use sunlight in order to make their energy. So green plants are usually this category, like photoplankton and algae. We also have chemoautotrophy, which is plants that use other chemicals besides light in their environment to make their energy. So we call that process chemosynthesis. So chemoautotrophy would be um, this process. Organisms that maybe live down in deep, dark regions of the ocean, which will use the chemicals released from deep sea uh, vents that are coming out of the crust, and they use those chemicals to make their own energy. So a lot of times they're like little bacteria. So now let's switch over to the heterotrophy side. So we have two main groups of heterotrophy. We have consumers, like us, and we have decomposers. So let's focus on consumers first. Consumers ingest organic matter, which is living or recently killed. That's a key difference from a decomposer. They were living or recently killed. So in the group of consumers, we have primary producers, oops, yeah, we have, we have the first order consumers is what we would say, which would be uh, organisms that eat or producers, so we call them primary, 
and they're, that's what you would consider an herbivore. They eat producers. And then we have secondary, which would eat other consumers. So they might eat an herbivore. So a carnivore would be someone we might use that name for, an omnivore, someone who eats meat and vegetables. Going back to decomposers, decomposers derive energy from non-living organic matter. So they usually are eating dead things that have been dead for a while, and they help break them down and decompose them back into soil. So we have two groups of decomposers. We have the detritivores, which ingest non-living matter, so they actually eat it and they ingest it, and they have a digestive system. And like earthworms would be like this, or wood lice. They, they actually are putting the food into their mouths and digesting it and ingesting it, meaning it goes in their mouth. A sapiotroph is an organism that they also eat dead things, but they do this by secreting digestive enzymes into it, and then they absorb those digestive products. So there are certain types of bacteria that do this and fungi. So like picture putting your hand on something and you secrete enzymes onto it, and then you can slowly start to absorb those nutrients from that thing that you put your hand on through your hand. So it's more of an absorption method than actually ingesting. So that's the difference between a detrivore and a sapiotroph. So if we're gonna be talking about the names we give people, or I mean organisms in a ecosystem based on their feeding method, we wanna talk about food chains. So food chains show the flow of energy through the trophic levels of a feeding relationship. So a couple words there, but first thing I wanna talk about is the flow of energy. So we no longer talk about who give. we never say who eats who, we say who gives energy to who, because you're older now, we, we're not trying to teach you who eats what. We wanna talk about energy flow. So we always start with who made the most energy first, and that's always gonna be a producer. A producer makes 100% of their energy. They made it from the sunlight and carbon dioxide, and they made their own sugar. They didn't have to eat anything to do that, so they considered 100% energy. So a producer is always usually the start of a food chain. Then it would flow to whoever eats that plant. So that would be usually a primary consumer, which eats Herb, which we would call an herbivore, which eats producers. Or like a cow, for example, who only eats grass. Then that energy would go, the primary consumer would give energy to a secondary consumer. Now this would be an organism that would eat a primary consumer. So they would be considered a carnivore or an omnivore. So think of us, for example, and we eat that cow that ate that grass. Sometimes food chains have a tertiary consumer, so this will be the final stage and this will be a top carnivore who would eat actually an omnivore or a carnivore as well in order to get energy. So notice the arrows pointing away. So it's saying who gives energy to who. So the plant gave energy to the herbivore, the herbivore gave energy to this omnivore or carnivore, and this omnivore or carnivore gave energy to this top level of carnivore. Eventually they stop. Food chains can't go on past that because it actually runs out of energy that can be passed on. So energy is not a cycle, it flows. It will end at some point. There's not enough. So these are some examples of some food chains. We have the yellow iris, which is going to give energy to this moth caterpillar right here. The moth caterpillar is going to give energy to this bird, and this bird is going to give energy to this larger bird, the sparrow hawk. So you can see a few other ones from woodland, arctic, or fresh water. So one thing we need to realize that is that um, there's different factors that can affect how animals or plants are distributed throughout an ecosystem. So temperature is a big factor that could do that. So all animals have adapted to survive in a narrow range of temperatures. So coral reefs, for example, they like to live in about 20 degrees Celsius water, not too hot and not too cold. Ectotherms, which are cold-blooded organisms that rely on external temperatures for their metabolism. So they need somewhere that they can at least get a little warm to help control their um, metabolism so that their body can function. Water is also a key 
ingredient. It can be fresh or it can be salty. How much do they need to drink? How much do they need for cooling off? Um, maybe it's a place to lay their eggs. Um, maybe it's a place to hunt like this insect, this strider over here. So it could be their habitat, for example. So these are just two things that could help distribute animals. Let's talk about a few more. Breeding sites. Some animals require specific types of sites, so like mosquitoes need water for egg laying. Um, food supply. Some species have adapted to feed on specific foods, so they need to be in locations that would have them, and you would only find them there, so for like pandas and bamboo. Territory. Some species establish and defend certain territories. For example, coyotes will mark their territory with their scent, and this will affect what animals will come into their territory or not. So there's, there's a lot of different factors in an ecosystem that could affect the distribution of animals. Plants also have the same uh, reasoning, but theirs is a little bit more based on what they need to survive. So temperature, water, salinity levels, minerals in the soil, light amount and soil pH are usually the areas that are gonna affect how they distribute. So here's an example for temperature. There's frost resistant crops, so crops that can grow in very cold temperatures, or fire germinating seeds. So for example, there's a tree called the manzanita shrub, which is in the state of California. And in order for it to germinate its seeds, they need to catch on fire. And that's why in California, um, these plants grow because California catches on fire quite often in different times of the year because it gets very dry and there's lightning and it can create a spark and then there's a burn and those seeds will then start to germinate and then there'll be new life of this plant. Um, light. Some plants can handle living in deep parts of the ocean or on the floor of a rainforest, right? They're covered by the canopy so they can't get that much light or plants that live at the top so they get a lot of light. Um, salinity levels. Some can handle, like mangroves can handle a larger amount of salinity than other plants. They need fresh water. So there's different factors in an ecosystem for plants as well that's gonna affect how they're distributed. There's also in a ecosystem, there's sometimes a species called a keystone species. And this cute little sea otter here is a keystone species and it regulates sea urchin populations. So he's having a feast right now on a bunch of sea urchins. And the, what it, the reason is because without that sea otter, those urchins would take over and they would affect all of the kelp, kelp and microalgae in an ecosystem, which would then affect other species that use those kelps maybe as habitat to hide from other um, larger predators. So, it, so the keystone species, we call it a keystone because it's key to maintaining that ecosystem. So a sea otter is an example of a keystone species. So here is going through this, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that when there was a time when maybe, so for example, a killer whale or an orca, they get energy from a sea otter. Now, if there is a large amount of sea otters dying because they've been eaten too much, you're gonna notice that in this area where there was no sea otters, the sea urchin population increased. And then also the kelp population decreased. So kelp is a source of food for crabs, snails, and geese, and it's a shelter. And that's gonna have a cascading effect in lots of different food chains and niches or like habitat life of other organisms in that same ecosystem. Another example of a keystone species is a starfish. And in this picture here, what they did is they did this uh, a test in a certain shoreline where they removed a group of starfish. Just, in, just basically they zoned off the area and kept removing them if they came. They put them in a different part of the shoreline and they blocked it off. And what they found is that all these different barnacles started to compete because the starfish kind of keeps down all the population. So not one out competes another. And they've all kind of found their niche where they can survive um, on this shoreline here in the background. And the, the starfish will help control that. Well, when the starfish is removed, what they noticed is all the species actually started to compete for different potential zones that they could be in. And all of the species had a de population decline 
and eventually only one was remaining, which was this Teus um, barnacle type snail, and they ended up being the more common one. So sometimes a keystone species also can help de-stress a population of, of different species and allow them to kind of know their zone and not compete with each other and keep the diversity in the area. So there's a bunch of different interactions that can happen, some negative and some positive. So in a community, you're going to see all different types of interactions. So the first one, the one I just talked about, competition. Anytime there's competition, it's going to create stress on a species, and that's going to cause usually a species to decline. Predation is, creates stress on a species as well because someone's being hunted, so you're stressed, or you're looking for food, so you're stressed. Um, so predator-prey relationships or interactions. There's also symbiotic relationships, which are long-term relationships between a species, like been going on for decades type of relationships. Like they just innately know that they're supposed to work with or work against this one other species. So mutualism is when both species benefit. So we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about the whole group of species. So both species would benefit from being around each other or this interaction. Commensalism is another type of symbiotic relationship. So these three here are a type of symbiosis. So commensalism is where one will benefit, but the other does not lose or gain anything. So it, it's almost like one is, um, uh, just there to kind of help out, but they're not they're not losing any nutrients from giving support to this this other organism, but they're not gaining anything either. Parasitism is where one species will benefit where the other is harmed. So for example, a leech on my arm, he'd be sucking the blood out of my arm, so I am losing in this relationship and it is gaining. So one way that, and, and one reason that species interact with each other is because they've created a niche for themselves. So each species has their own niche, and a niche is kind of like your job. It's what you, your daily routine that you do. It's your mode of existence in that ecosystem. So this can include where you live, what type of food you eat, and the different relationships you have. So if you think about me, I'm a teacher and I work at EBV. And my existence and my survival is built on how my relationships are with you guys as my students and how my relationships are with my colleagues. And I'm going to have a more effective life if I can maintain those relationships, but also keep in my own zone, right? I don't want to overstep certain boundaries. And um, I eat lunch at a certain time, right? I, I arrive, I eat lunch, I go home. And... These are all parts of my niche at EBV. So here in this picture, you can see these birds have kind of done the same thing. So in this one tree, there's these four different species there, and they live at different heights of the tree. So maybe they nest, or they look for food at different parts of the tree. So they kind of, they do have some areas that overlap, which can cause some competition or maybe some interactions like mutualism or parasitism or commensalism but otherwise they have also an area that's just kind of their own zone. So this is called the niche concept, that every species has its own unique niche or existence in an, in an ecosystem. Now, two species cannot survive indefinitely in the same habitat if their niches are identical. So this is why a lot of species have evolved to find their own way or their own food source or their own location that works more for them. So these are some graphs that kind of show the interactions that species can have. So species B and C here, they do have a little overlap here. So this is where you're going to see some interspecific competition, which means a competition between two different species. And that's going to create some stress. But they also have an area. Let's think of this as land area. They also have some areas that are just their own zone, where they can have their own niche and no competition and they specialize in these areas probably more. In this graph here, species A and D have some heavy overlapping, and this is going to create some negative negativity, which we would call the competitive exclusion principle, 
which means one of these species is going to have to go because they're sharing too much of the same space and they occupy too much of the same niche, so the same food resources, the same sleeping habitats. Um, so usually when we talk about competitive exclusion, it means that one's going to outcompete compete the other and exclude them. They're going to probably die off. In this picture here, you can see species A has a bigger niche, so they're more of a generalist species, so they can do well in a, a larger area, where species E has to be here. So species A doesn't really go into that zone, and species E can be a specialist and only use whatever's in this area. They can also avoid competition that way too. So species, they will try to figure out what niche makes the most sense for them. And we would call this their realized niche. But they also have an area that they have potential to um, kind of broaden into or spread out into if given the opportunity. And we would call that their fundamental niche. So the fundamental would be kind of like the dream. If I had more room, a bigger house. And the realized niche is like your reality. And that's your zone that you will you definitely need to maintain. So. Other species can limit one species niche. So in this experiment here, this is barnacle competition, and Connell, the scientist, in 1961 did this experiment in Scotland on a rocky seashore. And he, this is, and along any intertidal zone, you're gonna have a lower intertidal zone that gets covered with water more often, a middle intertidal zone, which is probably covered with water at some point of the day, and an upper intertidal zone that usually doesn't go into the water. So there's these are two different types of barnacles. You have Chimanthalus, Malus, and Balanus. <laughs> I botched that name. Um, but And when the, the Malus is by itself, it'll spread between the middle intertidal zone to the upper intertidal zone. But if you go to the Banalus side, or I'm sorry, when you go to the side where there's Banalus present and Chimalis present, you can see that Banalis ends up taking over the niche in the middle intertidal zone, and the Chimalis, <laughs> can't say that name, is going to be in the upper tidal zone. So they kind of have found their two realized niches, but this over here would be the fundamental niche, niche for the, the Malus if it didn't have to compete with that other barnacle, Banalis. So here's the definition. So fundamental niche is your potential mode of existence, where your realized niche is your actual mode of existence, which is going to result in adaptations and competition from other species. This image here kind of gives you an idea of the same concept you can see on the of, of a fundamental versus a realized niche. So here would be an abiotic variable. So let's say it's temperature. And here's another abiotic variable, y. This would be something you're measuring over here. And you can see there's minimum tolerance zones and maximum tolerance zones. So every species has something they can tolerate up to a certain point. So there's always an optimal thing that they would prefer to be at. They could push themselves one way or the other. So in this graph here, we would say that the middle is probably everyone's optimal niche. They would have, they're kind of in between their tolerance levels for the minimum and the maximum of this variable. This is where they would do best. This would be their fundamental niche. So if they had to spread out, if they needed to, they could go to this distance. So this would be their minimum tolerance level and this would be their maximum. But this is where they would prefer to be. And this graph kind of shows the same idea. We call this the Shelford's Law of Tolerance. And you can use this idea based on the abundance of a species. And you can map it out and see what maybe environmental factor might be affect, might be their, create their zones. So for example, here, this environmental factor is, this is the optimal zone. This is when there's the most of those individuals because they love this amount of water, let's per se this amount of fresh water. But anytime they get further away from that freshwater source on either side, you see it becomes a zone of stress. So any of this, the individuals of that species living out further from that water source are gonna start to feel that stress. And if they go past this line here, 
they're going to be in the zone of intolerance. So they've now gone too far away from the water source and their individual numbers have plummeted to nothing, to zero, so they've died off. So they can have to, this species, if they want to survive, have to maintain within this realized niche or this fundamental niche where they also include the zones of stress. So, like I said, two species cannot survive indefinitely if they have the same habitat or niche that are identical. One has to go, and we call this Gauze's uh, law of competitive exclusion or the competitive exclusion principle. And this data here is showing just that. So here's two different species of paramecium, which are in the genus of a protist. And when they were growing alone, so each of these lines up here that have the dots, show when they're growing separately. And you can see over the course of days, there's 18 days here, and you can see how many there were um, in volume when they were growing separately. But as soon as they were mixed together, you can see that the species started to go to, be, to reproduce less. And that's because they were competing with each other. And you'll notice that this bottom species of paramecium right here eventually died off. So this supports the idea of competitive exclusion principle that no two species can occupy the same identical niche. They either have to adapt and, and immigrate um, or migrate to another region where they can have another food source and they're out of the competition zone or they have to survive and beat out the other competition or die. So that's called the competitive exclusion principle that was founded by the scientist Gauze. Be expecting to analyze graphs like this, similar to uh, this one, about fundamental niches versus realized niches and how it can lead to the competitive exclusion principle. So here's some more examples of the competitive ex uh, exclusion principle in an interspecific competition. So remember that's between two separate species. Um, here's an example of the Eurasian red squirrel that has suffered competitive exclusion due to the introduction of this eastern gray squirrel to the United Kingdom from the United States. Now this gray squirrel just happens to be larger, stronger, and can store more fat in the winter, making it better able to survive and reproduce. So it's way more tolerant to that environment. So it's just like, woohoo, thanks for inviting me to the United Kingdom. This is great. And this poor little Eurasian red squirrel has started to die off and he's now in protected areas. So they're trying to get their numbers back up to a higher population. Now sometimes species just want to avoid competition altogether and they do something called niche partitioning. It's like they all got together and sat around a table and were like, all right, I will take hunting at night if you will take it during the day. Then we don't have to compete with each other. Or they're like, I'll take the top of the tree if you will take the middle of the tree. And they've just basically partitioned it out. It's like they divvied up the area so they don't have to compete with each other. And there's a dip, there's, and we call that niche, niche, <laughs> niche partitioning. So this is an example of different wob warblers, which are different types of these birds here and they occupy very similar niches in this tree, but they've just found that they've picked a habitat at different areas or they look for food only in these areas of this type of tree. And then the result is although none of them use the whole tree as their niche, they each have their own niche within that same habitat and can coexist successfully. So niche partitioning can be spatial, which is dividing up space like this here, or it can be morphological, which means they have different shapes or structures. So, for example, beak sizes, so they can eat different things, so they don't have to compete for the same food source. Or, and morphological would mean like body shape. And temporal would be different times of the day or year, so maybe seasons or hunting day at night. This is an example of, I'm going to go through a few examples now for each of these concepts. So this one's an example of the zones or limits of tolerances and zones of stress. So black mangroves, which are all over Florida, if you've been there and you've seen them along the coastlines, they grow their roots in the water. And sometimes the water will recede um, during tides and you can see their roots and then they'll get covered with water again. 
um, they can survive in high salinity levels, anywhere from zero to 96 parts per thousand PPT of salt in the water. But they grow best in a salinity level of 24 to 48. So they have an optimal zone. That would be where they want to be. But they can grow anywhere on the outside of 48 to 96 or 0 to 24. And they could still be successful, but that's going to be stressful for them. So we would call that zones of stress. And anything beyond that um, is going to, so 0 would mean no salt. And then anything above 96 is too salty. You're going to see them start to die off. So that's an example of an optimal zone or an optimal niche and or a realized niche versus a fundamental niche where they can stretch out to their, their zones of tolerance. Um, coral is another example of zones of tolerance. So this, this, red, this map here is showing you all the coral reefs throughout the world. And if you notice, there's a good cluster right through the middle, which is where the equator is, which is much warmer. And you're going to see that if you look at this map, this area is temperatures that are in excess of 20 degrees Celsius. So they're warmer than 20 degrees, but not so warm, like not above 30 degrees because coral doesn't want to go above 30 degrees Celsius, but they love 20 degrees Celsius. So that's why coral reefs are going to be at an optimal zone in that area, but anything beyond that starts to become a stress zone. Speaking of coral reefs, I want to connect this to symbiotic relationships. And this is one that you have to know this example. There will be a question about it for sure on my test or the IB exam. So zooanthial are algae that live inside coral reefs. And they're actually what give coral reefs their beautiful colors. Um, and coral could not survive without them. So, and, and then zooanthials so cannot live without the coral. So they have a mutualistic relationship. They're both benefiting from each other. So they live inside the coral. So zooanthial provide, or sorry, the coral, starting here, the coral provide the algae with a protective environment, so a home, and these coral polyps secrete calcium carbonate to build the stony skeletons, which house the coral polyps and the zooanthial. So the zooanthial live in these coral polyps, these little um, holes within the coral as their house or their habitat. And these compounds um, need this in order to do photosynthesis. So they take in CO2 and these algae are gonna do photosynthesis, which is going to release oxygen for the coral. So now the coral is getting oxygen, which they need to survive, and the algae help remove waste from the coral and it supplies the coral with food, like glucose, glycerol, and amino acid. So all of those are products from the photosynthesis that the zooanthial does. They also get oxygen from it. So the relationship between the algae and the coral polyp facilitate a tight cycling of nutrient in these nutrient-poor tropical waters. Because coral reefs are actually, even though they're so vibrant and full of life, the water is usually warmer, and it's, it's usually not as nutrient-rich. So if you're looking at this picture here, you're seeing over here what it looks like when coral starts to be bleached, so when it becomes hard coral. And that means the coral's dying, and it actually means that the zooanthial have also died. So they're not able to do their mutual, mutualistic relationship anymore. So corals live in very nutrient-poor waters and have a certain zone of tolerance to water temperature, salinity, UV radiation, opacity, and nutrient quantities. So in the sense of temperature, um, their zone is right here. They can't go above 30 degrees Celsius, or you're going to see the zooanthial become impaired and the coral start to die. So when you think about global warming and what's happening, even though corals like warm water, they don't want them to get too warm, right? And that's what's happening from some of the global warming and climate change. Um, but there is also other things ca that could cause this, which would be salinity levels increasing, UV radiation, um, the opacity of the water, and how much nutrients are in the water. So in summary from this topic, some things that you should be able to think about. So how do species interact with one another, one another and their environment? 
The distribution of species is affected by limiting factors, usually, so abiotic and biotic. So the way organisms are spread in an area has to do with um, maybe the temperature or the amount of water or the pH or the salinity levels. Those would be some examples of abiotic. And biotic would be like food sources or different relationships that they have with other species in the area. Breeding sites as well and different habitat availability. Because of these distributions of species and how they're affected by limiting factors, it results in various interactions with other species and the environment. So symbiotic relationships, predator-prey relationships, competition. And this leads to species forming a realized niche, an area that they've adapted to, that's their zone that they can be successful at and can support an ecosystem so that it can thrive. All right, so that's it for today. Please put your notes in Manage Back when you're done, and please make sure you've maybe highlighted any questions that you want to ask at the beginning of next class. Thanks, and I hope you guys have a great day.